Hello, everyone. Happy Thursday, and welcome to Something to Talk About Live. My name is Jamie Hinkle. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm the Learning and Inclusion Manager at PFLAG National. Uh, I'm going to be with you all in the chats and the comments and all of the places on social media. Um, so if you have anything that you'd like to ask our guests, please let me know. Uh, and just like every week, what I'm going to do now is bring in Jean Marie Devetta to facilitate today's conversation. Hi, Jean Marie. Hey, Jamie. How's it going? Good. I love that color on you. It's very Halloween. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't know if I looked like a jack-o'-lantern or maybe I could pull it off. I'm somewhere between jack-o'-lantern and pulling it off. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, a pumpkin t-shirt and a tutu is one of my prime Halloween costumes. So I'm I'm into it. I love the jack-o'-lantern look. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. And I know that today we are talking about one of your very favorite topics yeah. in the entire universe. Yeah, I'm a little bit jealous that you get to talk to our colleagues about uh, voting in the midterm. So I'm eager to hear what they have to share with us. Well, if we have anything coming in on the chat, we will see you a little bit later. But otherwise, thank you very much, Jamie, for getting Absolutely. it started. See you later. Hey, everybody. My name is Jean Marie Nevada. I'm the Director of Learning and Inclusion at PFLAG National. And every single week, we get together to talk about something related to LGBTQ equality and inclusion. And oops, I didn't mention my pronouns. My pronouns are she and Aya. Um, this week, as I mentioned with Jamie, um, we are going to be talking about voting. So for those of you who are joining us um, and would like to read this week's article, it is a really it's a really great article. It's a little bit scary, too. Um, you can access it if you go to straightforequality.org slash discussion series. And this week's article came from The New York Times. Cecilia Kang wrote it, and it was called The Most Dominant Toxic Election Narratives Online. Um, and so just sort of as a little preview of what um, is covered in the article, uh, it sort of emerges that there are three primary toxic narratives that are actually poisoning our electoral system. The first is rampant falsehoods about rampant uh, uh, voter fraud. Second is actual threats of violence from people, people who are actually threatening people trying to vote, making them feel intimidated. And finally, the last is divisive posts, posts on healthcare or social policy. And a lot of those do have to do um, with LGBTQ people. So every single week, we do bring in really, really smart people to help us with our conversation. Um, and this week is no exception. I have two of my fantastic colleagues from PFLAG National joining me. So I'd love to bring in Diego and Patrick. Hello, gentlemen. Welcome. Thank you. Hello. Hello. So um, the first thing that I want to do, I only gave your first names, um, even though I think you, everyone should just know you by first names by now, um, but that might just be in my own head, but let's hope it's not. So what I'm wondering, maybe Diego first, then Patrick, I would love if you could both tell people who you are and what your role at PFLAG is. There's a lot of us sometimes, and I think people get confused. I'd love for them to hear about what you do. Thanks so much. My name is Diego Sanchez. My pronouns are he and L, and I'm the director of advocacy policy and partnerships at PFLAG National. That means that I get the great, great joy of working with legislators in terms of actually scripting and promoting particular pieces of legislation, working with our PFLAGers to move that forward as well, and working hand in glove with my, my very good friend and colleague, Patrick. Hi, everyone. I'm Patrick Cochran. My pronouns are he, him, um, and I am the Advocacy and Policy Engagement Senior Coordinator at PFLAG, which just means that I get to talk to all of you lovely PFLAGers um, and all of our PFLAG supporters and connect you with various advocacy opportunities at all levels of government, including engaging you in the 2022 midterm campaigns. There you go. Thank you so much. Um, and I am lucky enough to work with both of you. Um, and we do a lot of education work together on this particular topic. So Diego, I'd love to start with you. So um, one thing this week's article discusses is, and, and to quote the authors, um, misinformation around the integrity of voting has actually metastasized. Um, they cite things like the fact that the, stole, the term stolen election were mentioned 900% more in a year-over-year -year look at Twitter mentions. So from your perspective, I mean, there's probably why is it happening? What is it? Sounds 
So folks, it seems as if we may have lost Jean Marie to some connectivity issues. Or do we have you back, Jean Marie? I'm back. You're did back. my question stick? It did not. We got about half of it. So let's let's do that again. Thanks again, Jamie. I was wondering if I disappeared or someone else did. This is we, such we, a philosophical we dilemma. Heard you do, the, do the 900 percent We heard that part. Thank you so much. So the comment, the thing was the phrase stolen election was mentioned um 900 percent more year over year between 2020 and 21. So why is it happening? And can you break down what some of the sources of this really extreme unrest are? Yes, and it's it's very, very critical. I mean, frankly, it's a product of the moment. And you know, it we look at what we're 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 seeing when you when when people are already apathetic or concerned about getting out to vote, feeding lies that say your vote will never count because it's never really going to be counted because it's yours. Those kind of things discourage people from taking action. And that's actually part of the point. It's to use the power of intimidation to make people step away and back off. And the thing that I always look out for, it's just one of those things that frankly, the better the language sounds about the name of the organization, the more evil it probably is. So the one I'll call out, I think is maybe true the vote which is uh, based in Houston, Texas. Um, and when you look at the things that they're saying, it's not just that they're being said, but it's also the replication through social media. And the one thing the New York Times article that really everyone should look at is go to the media organizations that they cite and look at how many social media followers each of these people who are spreading bad news actually have it just shows that when if they just set it into a you know a, a glass jar and sealed it that's one thing but when false information is is granted to people who are let's just say not the brightest bulb in this in the the beautiful lamp uh then it runs the risk of that being repeated if they can remember all of it and if they can't they'll just remember the part that they do repeat and it's probably going to be based on terrible false information. So making people feel that their vote doesn't count is part of the goal. The other is to do the intimidation by presence. You know, it's like it's like high school gangs, so to speak. It's like, you know, people who are opposed to folks who are already marginalized, already scared to, you know, if I have all the valid IDs, I'm still scared to have to show it because I'm feeling like somebody's already prepared and have their lips shaped to say no, even if I'm valid. So I think those are the things that are going on with that. Thank you. And I, you know, I appreciate the point that you're making about social media. I think it used to take longer for misinformation to get spread. You had to come in contact with people. There had to be some other channel, but this is instantaneous. I mean, one tweet can go viral in a matter of seconds and it is just so quick. And I think to your point, I mean, you made a joke about what people can remember. Social media is designed to remember tiny little bites, and often those bites are just damaging enough to actually cause the chaos I think that people want to do. So I, I really appreciate that analysis. So, Patrick, you know, we're looking at increasing accusations of fraudulent elections. We are looking at people actively working to destroy people's confidence in their own vote. We're looking to intimidate people to not actually go out and vote. What does this mean for you as an organizer? You are somebody who is talking to our P-flaggers and, and like-minded people all the time. You know, is it making your job more difficult? What does that look like? What kind of stuff is coming up? Well, yes, is the short answer. It does, it does make my life difficult and I deeply resent it. Um, but you know, it's, I, I think there are a couple of things uh, that we kind of have to do um, as organizers, as anybody that's working in this space where we're trying to get people out to vote. Um, number one is that we really do need to highlight all of the possible mobilization resources we can, um, because I do think that one of the ways in which um, certain anti-democracy activists um, can really seize upon this moment is when um, you have these like really low turnout races where the margins really are very close and they can you know try to throw out ballots. Um, and that really does make a difference. Um, whereas if, if people really show up and vote 
and you know you have big enough margins um, where throwing out um, a couple of ballots is not going to make a big difference. I think that's a big um, security. Um, you know, if you have as much participation as possible, um, if you have you know enough people voting, where you know doing little uh, heinous things on the margins isn't isn't going to make as big a difference. And number two, I think what we really need to do is highlight to the best of our abilities uh, voter protection resources, um, which we do on our website. Um, you know, we have the National Voter Protection Hotline uh, highlighted there. We have various other organizations that do a lot of this work. Um, and I think it's going to become extremely important um, that people know their rights heading into the ballot box and they are prepared to call for assistance when it's needed. Because these people are not going to, when I say these people, anti-democracy activists are not going to let up. They're going to try to intimidate people out of voting. They're going to you know, sit there and try to intimidate people from dropping their ballots into drop boxes, things like that. And we need to have people who are prepared to vote and get the protection that they need when it's needed. Um, so please, please, please check out those resources and know them ahead of time so that you can use them when you need them. It's really an interesting point that you're making about being aware of what to do if you encounter this. And again, we're, uh, Jamie is actually scrolling our pflag.org slash vote um, link. I really encourage you to check those out. We have a whole bunch of different kinds of resources up there. I know that I helped record one of our little mini briefings. Um, and it was about what happens if you go to the ballot box and something bad happens. And I think it, it taught me a lot about, I have to tell you, I bring some of the information with me just in case something happens that I will know exactly what to do. So knowing it actually helps make you feel more confident. So Diego, you've been leading policy for a national organization that has a history of decades, nearly five of them, um, through advocacy work. You know, PFLAGers have always been pretty fierce when it comes to getting out there to vote. We've been really active in advocacy. But what are your biggest concerns when you look at these kinds of developments? Because some of this is legitimately scary. We are talking about people who have threatened physical violence in some cases. Are you concerned that it will have an impact on voter turnout? Um, and do you think this really is going to take an additional toll on people? Uh, I'm glad you asked that, Jean Marie. I mean, you know, one of the things people think of, like, this is more than I've ever seen before. And the truth is, there has been vitriol and there has been violence and there has been anger and there has been combativeness but most of it has been a bit quieter it's in the small towns where you probably over a ballot initiative over whether you should in institute recycling or you know something that's that's whether you should have a consolidated county and city law enforcement those kind of things are what used to bring up the noise but it was quieter it was powerful and it was present but it was quieter so the answer to me is i think p flaggers are going to stand strong we know that we're looking for safety first and we know that p flaggers know one thing and that's how to stand next to another p flagger so I think that, that the partnership that's created through the relationships built through PFLAG creates a better set of voters, people who won't go alone, people who will make sure that they're informed, you know, making the plan, like Brian's video tells you, make a plan when you're going to vote. And I think that the things that we're seeing, the noise that we're hearing, you know, when folks are yelling, you know, you talked about one of the issues that's coming up now about health care. That's directly focused on transgender kids. And there's, you know, I'm glad I'm not the strategist for the people who are opposed to democracy because I, you know, I would know better than to pick on people's children. It's kind of the one thing you just shouldn't do. You can probably take their lunch, but you can't take their kids lunch. And so you really have and sit in fire, firing up people who are about protecting the rights of their own family members that have every right as everyone else. I think it's going to make us very strong. It's going to make people turn out at the ballot and looking at participation, even in primaries that, that just happened, there was activity, there was interest and people were paying attention to the vote even at that point. And I honestly feel that with what we've gone through in the past, even presidential cycles, 
it has made people stay awake during these off presidential years because everything's really important farther down the ballot uh, that you go, the more it affects your next door uh, and, and down the road. So I think people are educated on that. Thank you. And, you know, and I think that's a really interesting point. The whole tenor of this has changed. The things that are getting people out has changed. But I, I think you also made a really good reference there. I think that people are starting to see midterm elections as far more significant. I mean, they've always been significant. We know that. But I don't think they've had the same priority. Unfortunately, I also think our opposition is seeing that, too. And they've you know leaned really deeply into this. But if there is a good outcome, it's this awareness that every election matters and every part of your ballot matters from top to bottom. So I'm so glad that you said that. So, Patrick, you know, I, I keep coming back to as I read this article. I mean, I, I'm well aware about this. We work in this a lot. We hear these stories all the time. There's something about reading about people threatening to bring thousands of people to sit around a ballot box that really is frightening. And it is so fundamentally un-American and so fundamentally undemocratic. It almost feels like it can't really be happening. Um, you know, in some cases, there is encouragement of having um, physical altercations. There's a mention of the Patriot tailgate party um, in the article. Some people call it free speech. So do you think that what is happening is another valid method of protest? Or do you think this has actually officially crossed a line past free speech and into another place? And have we ever seen anything like this before? So no, this is not free speech. Uh, this is this is people trying to intimidate people. Full stop, bar none. That's it. Um, this, is, this is people trying to make sure that especially particular groups of people do not get to have their voices heard in government. Um, and unfortunately, that is something that has happened quite a lot in American history. Um, you know, this is this is not new. Uh, this is something that we've seen all over the place um, since the beginning of this country. Um, this was quite. Uh, this is a tactic that got used a lot, um, especially in the South uh, during Reconstruction, um, especially during the Civil Rights era. This got used quite a bit. Um, by uh, white extremist groups like the Ku Klux Klan and others to make sure that black people didn't get to vote in the South. Um, and unfortunately, it a lot of the times it was quite effective because they were very, very willing to be very, very violent. Um, and that, that, you know, had horrible, horrible impacts for decades and continues to have horrible impacts. Um, I think that uh, it's important now though uh, to recognize that again, you know, we we do have these voter protection resources now, um, and specifically, I think when it gets to you know violence being threatened, uh, the DOJ, the Department of Justice, uh, does have um, a specific um, office that deals with voter protection. Uh, we of course have um, criminal investigative services like the FBI um, when threats of physical violence are being made. Um, those should not be brushed off. These should not be taken lightly. And they certainly shouldn't just be something where, you know, this happens and they just kind of get away with it. Um, so this is another situation where I think people need to be very aware of what resources exist. Um, and if we're going to see these, you know, people trying to intimidate other people out of voting, uh, making sure you're aware of uh, that DOJ office, making sure that you are ready uh, to you know, kind of call for backup here um, if uh, people are going to try to block your access to the ballot because it is your right to have that access and nobody gets to take that away from you. Um, I was not leading with that question, but I am so glad that you absolutely made that parallel because this is definitely not the first time we've seen this in so much of this playbook. You are in fact absolutely accurate. Does in fact come from some of the worst civil rights battles. It was deployed by groups like the KKK that is the role model that is the playbook that is being used right now and we need to call it out as that um this is a complete replication of what we've seen in the past except in some ways i think it's actually uglier um because it happens at such a rapid rapid speed and it's going so deep so diego um p flags advocacy work takes a lot of forms some of it's educational some is of it is straight up advocacy um, some of it actually gets into the judicial realm. Um, we have talked about where some of the most painful states for our families are right now. And one of those definitely is Texas. Um, I know we're talking about voting today, but 
Could you just share a quick update for people on where PFLAG's case in Texas is and, and give a little bit of an explanation for people who may not be familiar with what's happening? I think you're still on mute. I think you're so right. The second <laughs> time in my life and you're always catching me. Uh, Texas is one of my home states. My dad's from Floresville, Texas, and uh, most of my family members are in San Antonio and Floresville still. I'll tell you, the thing with PFLAG is we have done the brave thing of representing families in Texas in PFLAG v. Abbott, uh, meaning Governor Abbott, uh, and uh, who is the governor of Texas, I should say. The, the issue comes down to families in Texas are not able to grant their transgender or non-binary children access to things that they need that should be granted everywhere. And the thing about the, the great thing about PFLAG v. Abbott is that we're not only protecting PFLAG families who've always been with us, but everyone who ends up being part of PFLAG National is included as part of this the circuit of this class and and the great thing about that is there are families who are not able to stand up for fear of being disclosed or combated or bullied and they are protected under PFLAG v Abbott the great news is that for the second time we've had things go our way we've got the injunction we've got things that are looking good for exactly why PFLAG and its families are there and represented. But it's not just one part of Texas. We're actually protecting all the families throughout Texas and using as the model for that, the families who are members of PFLAG National. And it's, it's easy to get involved with us to do that. Thank you so much for that explanation. I have to tell you, we have done many things over the years that I have seen PFLAG do. This is one of the ones that makes me most proud. And um, we should, I should say, okay. I should add, I'm sorry, to say that uh, Lambda Legal, ACLU, and ACLU of Texas are our legal organizations. We partner with them all the time. This is clearly, you know, we do amicus briefs on cases they do all over the place. This one, we're honored to have it as ours. Uh, I totally agree. And they are absolutely spectacular. And their attorneys are brilliant to listen to. It's, it is a masterclass in, in uh, legal conversations. Jamie is telling me that we do have a question from the audience. So I'm going to see if Jamie can quickly pop in and share with us what somebody would like to know about. Yeah. So somebody was wondering if we could all talk a little bit about the backlash against mail, uh, voting by mail and sort of where that came from, why it happened, if we're seeing it come up again in these conversations about voter fraud and stolen elections and voter intimidation and, and those sorts of things. So I'd love to hear from folks about that. Sure. Um, so I think that's a great question. Um, a lot of this stems from the fact that in 2020, um, we had more people than ever vote by mail uh, because of just the realities of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, people did obviously did not want to wait in line in close quarters with a bunch of people, so they voted by mail. Um, and in a lot of states, uh, the mechanism by which mail votes are counted means that it takes a lot longer to count those ballots than it takes to count ballots that are done in person on election day. So there were states uh, like Pennsylvania, like Wisconsin, where the ballot returns that came in from election day ballots in person looked a lot different than the mail-in ballots. And when the mail-in ballots were counted, the election looked a little different. Um, and instead of just thinking to themselves, oh, well, that makes sense. There were lots of people uh, that kind of took that to mean, oh, well, that means that the, uh, the election was stolen and all these mail ballots uh, were you know, fake and fraudulent and just used to change the outcome of the election. Obviously, that's not true. Um, but that's, I think, where it comes from. Um, and I mean, for me personally, I think mail voting is the easiest way to do it. Um, it's really great. It gives you a ton of time to like look at who your candidates are and, you know, carefully fill in your ballot. Um, and, you know, if that is how you want to do uh, your ballot, you should do it that way. 
Uh, my only piece of advice would be to do it as early as you possibly can. Um, you do not want to leave it to chance that your ballot might not arrive on time, uh, because then that leads to all sorts of issues where your ballot might be a provisional ballot or it might get thrown out. Um, and one thing that I can actually tell you from personal experience is if you turn in your ballot early enough and there's something wrong with your ballot, like if you didn't follow the instructions properly, you didn't sign it or something like that, it gives the Board of Elections time to contact you, give you your ballot back so that you can do it right and then vote and have your vote counted. Um, if you don't do it early enough though, they just don't have the time to do that. And most of the time, your ballot's just not gonna count. Um, so please do it early. Number one, just to make sure that it arrives on time. And number two, to make sure that if there's some sort of mistake or some sort of error, the State Board of Elections can contact you and take care of it. Yeah, and I'll just, they just, you think about two things. One is, we have people overseas who are serving our country and their families get to vote from overseas and their ballots look different than the ballot. But but suddenly people, you know, those have always looked different. They're, it's not like having a different ballot is unusual. And then I really want to hear a little from Jamie because she lives in a state where that is the only way to do it. So maybe uh, and, and also make sure you look at what color ink you're supposed to use, mm -hmm. follow all the instructions, but I'd love to hear a little from Jamie. Yeah, so I, I live in Portland, Oregon. Um, I have been here for about six years, and in my state, the only way that you can cast a ballot is by mail, with some exceptions, but I don't have to do anything. My ballot just shows up in the mail, and it comes along with a book that has information about every ballot initiative, every candidate from dog catcher to president. And I get to, like Patrick said, sit with that and read it and look at various endorsements and look at comments from each of the people who's running for office and make a more educated decision that I may have when I was you know, my a first time voter in Richmond, Virginia and just voting down ticket based on a party. Um, it, it really has provided me with this opportunity where I feel much more engaged in what's happen happening locally because I am allowed to and I'm given the opportunity to sit with it for a couple days, fill it out at my own leisure, and then I have the opportunity to either mail it back at no cost to me, I can put it in my mailbox, or I can go drop it off at, for me personally, I've used the Dropbox at my local uh, public library. And it is just, I think it's phenomenal. Um, we also know that Oregon is one of the states that has a really pretty high voter participation rate because it is made so easy for people. Um, and there are not widespread allegations of fraud. I mean, this is something that has been happening in Oregon for decades. And we see it to be a very effective way for people to cast their ballots. Um, the one additional piece of advice that I wanted to, to throw in, um, in terms of if you have requested a mail-in ballot, because that is one of the things that is required by your state, and you then forget about it, or you don't get it into the mail, or you're afraid it's not going to arrive by the date that it needs to, you can hold on to that ballot and take it with you to the ballot box on election day. You will still be allowed to vote. You basically just hand it back and say, I, I didn't get to take the, do this, I wanna vote now. And I just want people to know that as well. And I think it's a great reminder to us that voting by mail also is, it enables more people to do it. Um, it is classist, our current system. It is, is angled towards people who have the time and means to spend a whole day potentially waiting to vote. Um, it is ableist also, um, and this is the most inclusive way of doing things. Um, we are almost at time, so I am going to have to get things wrapped up. But Jamie, Patrick, Diego, thank you so much for being here. Um, and please, please, please check out the resources this whole team has created. They are absolutely incredible. Well, everybody, that gets us to the end of yet another episode of Something to Talk About Live. We'll be back next week with another great show. It's going to be a really fun one, I promise. I mean, all of them are fun, but um, one of my topics that I enjoy getting into. Um, so please check out those um, resources at pflag.org slash vote. Please also remember our Read with Love campaign is still going, which is pflag.org slash read with love. 
We'll be back again next week. If you need help before then, please visit us at pflag.org slash find to locate your nearest PFLAG chapter. My name is Jean Marie Nevada. This is something to talk about live. Um, we'll leave you the way we leave you every single week with a reminder to run fast, laugh hard, and most of all, please be kind. See you next week, everyone.